Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, depending um, where you are watching us from. Uh, my name is Rachel Deer. I'm your moderator for this program. Uh, welcome to COVID-19, Keeping Up with a Moving Target. Thanks so much for joining us. So at this point, I'd like to welcome our faculty, Dr. Vega and Dr. Hunkai. Thank you so much for your time, both of you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, here are our faculty's disclosures. And this educational activity is supported by independent educational grant from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. All activity content and materials have been developed solely by the planning committee members and faculty presenters. Here are learning objectives for today. So describe current management strategies and identify potential treatments for mild to moderate COVID-19. Evaluate best practices for managing patients with COVID-19 using monoclonal antibodies and other agents. Describe current management strategies and identify potential treatments for COVID-19 requiring hospitalization. And finally, assess the impact of COVID-19 on Black, Latinx, and American Indian, Alaska Native communities and the factors contributing to health disparities in these communities. And just a special note, um, all material presented today is current as of today, October 1st, 2021. Happy October, everyone. Uh, so for the most up-to-date guidance, uh, please refer to the following NIH COVID-19 treatment guidelines here on this slide. So I'm going to turn it over to our faculty now. All right. Well, uh, Rachel, thank you for the great introduction and for running through those questions. Those uh, biologic agents are always difficult to pronounce, and I find it's like uh, when you're speaking a foreign language, the faster you go, the better. Uh, so you just have to dive in and, and, and blow it, as you'll see me do in a couple minutes. <laughs> but, uh, but at least at least you're giving it, you get it over with quickly, maybe. Um, so uh, I'm Chuck Vega, and um, you know, in Santa Ana, California, where I have my community health center, uh, we have uh, been affected uh, by this uh, latest wave of COVID-19. Um, which was, you know, really kind of a surprise if you thought of our attitudes, uh, maybe late spring, early summer, when things were really looking uh, better before the Delta variant started to spread. And, uh, and so I've, I've been seeing a, a lot more cases, again, after a, a nice lull, a much needed lull for, for everyone in our community. Um, and most cases, I think it's important to remember, are uh, managed as outpatients. So mo most patients do fit in that mild to moderate disease category. While I was uh, telling uh, Dr. Hankai that we'll, I'll probably get three notices during this presentation that our uh, emergency department is down for saturation. Um, and we are very mindful about keeping, trying to keep patients out of the ED, out of the ICU, moving through so we can uh, have those resources because we had to practice stewardship again when we kind of thought we were through that. Um, we can't. Most of the cases that, uh, that we see are managed as outpatients, and we have some good tools to manage them. Uh, this slide's really helpful uh, just as a refresher for uh, the virology, uh, the symptomatology, um, and where treatment can fit in uh, when it comes to SARS-CoV-2. And so I'm not going to describe everything here. Just remember that patients still can get sicker in that second week, and that's where you see more of that inflammatory response uh, to the infection kind of takes over in terms of driving uh, symptoms, primarily dyspnea and hypoxia, which is what puts a lot of folks in the ED and the ICU. Uh, and so uh, I'm just going to be talking about that stage. I'm going to be more focused on this early stage where you really want to initiate, just like you would say with influenza um, and other uh, viral respiratory illnesses, the sooner you get treatment on board is, uh, is better. And so, and we have some options now for treating folks with more mild and moderate uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now, uh, I'm always mindful as to who's at high risk. This uh, grid has changed a lot, but it actually has been pretty stable over the past several months. And I'm not going to call out all the conditions, um, but in a meta-analysis, um, COVD was uh, noted to be one of the highest risk conditions in terms of complications of COVID-19. Um, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes now have been, you know, each are a risk factor. But interestingly, you would think that in general, for most folks, because I see patients with chronic kidney disease and diabetes and heart failure and COPD, and generally those effects are additive. So the more factors you have in an individual patient, the higher their risk goes. Interestingly, in one study, uh, the presence of obesity didn't necessarily increase uh, patients' risk for complications more than having type 2 diabetes alone. So that's one good thing to hold on to. But basically, in my practice, uh, this is the folks I'm seeing every day. I, I manage a lot of chronic illness. So, so therefore, I'm constantly thinking that if my patients are going to get sick, 
with COVID-19. We need to act quickly uh, to get treatment on board right away. And it's not just me who has to be aware of that. It's the patients, too. So we really want to counsel patients and, of course, vaccinate everyone as much as possible. Another big group here that wasn't mentioned on that last um, uh, chart was the uh, is folks of color. Um, so American Indians, Alaska Natives, uh, Latinx, uh, black individuals, uh, higher rates of COVID-19, um, higher rates of hospitalization, higher rates of mortality overall compared um, you know, with, uh, with white adults. So, um, so we see this disparity, and I think there's been uh, a lot made of this disparity. Speaking of the emergency department, um, we know that uh, those same uh, racial and ethnic groups are more likely to visit the emergency department, or more likely to have to go into the ED um, because of COVID-19. Uh, why? Well, I think one thing that should be clear, and this is something that I know in my own family, is that uh, there's a, a lack of access to care, uh, for, particularly for, uh, for Latinx, American Indian, Alaska Native, and, and Black communities. Uh, so they may not have a primary care to go to. They're, the ED is essentially their source of care. So when you get really you know, sick with mild to moderate illness, sick with more severe illness, you know, go to the ED because that's, that's, what's, that's the, just the way it's been. Why are these rates of COVID-19 higher and why are the outcomes worse uh, among these racial and ethnic minorities? Um, it has a lot to do uh, with being frontline workers. It has a lot to do with living in crowded conditions. Um, it has a lot to do, yeah, with, with not being able to practice good infection control. I've got, uh, in some cases, three families in a two-bedroom apartment living together and, and, you know, try to isolate in that kind of situation. It's, it's impossible. Um, so it's, I think, the one thing I really want to drive home with these, and we'll present some more data on disparities around COVID-19 later, it's not related to an increased concentration of ACE2 receptors. It's not something genetic that's passed on that has to do with uh, people's immune response. It is social determinants of health and, and these risk factors that have been present for a long time uh, that have made uh, the COVID-19 has really brought into focus, unfortunately, with really tragic results with high rates of hospitalizations and high rates of mortality. In communities like mine, my practice in Santa Ana is 80% um, Spanish preferred, so I see almost uh, a high majority of uh, Latinx patients, and I've seen uh, how, what a toll it's taken on the families there and the community overall. So let's focus on what we can do in terms of ambulatory patients. Um, I don't have a, this is not uh, new to many of you who manage uh, folks with COVID-19, uh, and the rules regarding uh, isolation have stayed uh, generally the same. Um, I really want to have everybody uh, have a pulse oximeter at home who has COVID-19. They're impossible to get. Let's see. This time of year, a year ago, they were starting to be kind of finally become more available because uh, it took a while to manufacture enough to to get out there. Um, they were they were not around um, in summer of 2020. It was impossible to get them unless you were uh, discharged with one from the hospital, which wasn't an ideal way to go either, uh, meaning you were hospitalized. Um, so so generally, these are the same rules I follow, and most of the time, I'm uh, I'm releasing folks from isolation after 10 days. You can release after seven days with uh, testing, but oftentimes the testing adds one or two days to get the results. So by the time you actually uh, get the results back, you're saving maybe one or two days. So most folks are just doing the 10 days and then going going out. So one reason I think they're able to, you know, to break that isolation and they're not going to the emergency department or into the hospital is thanks to uh, the use of monoclonal antibodies. Uh, to be truthful in our system, monoclonal antibodies, I, you know, I, you might have heard me tell the story before because we've been using them for a while. And, um, you know, last winter I became, we became very adept at using them. We had an infusion center. It became very efficient. It took a while. Uh, it's, you know, these, these uh, products are not uh, necessarily easy to use because they have to be infused IV and there has to be a monitoring period. But, um, but then we, the, the infusion center got, you know, very little business, you know, in the, over the spring. So, so we, it was shut down. And guess what? Now we have to have a new plan. And so we've, uh, we've uh, got another infusion center opened up again for, uh, for all these folks coming with the Delta variant at this point. So, yeah, it's, it's, again, something we thought we could move away from, but it's, it's worth it. It's worth it to make that effort. It's worth it to have an algorithm and a protocol so we can get these um, monoclonal antibodies uh, done uh, on time because they work. 
Um, so this is uh, banlimumab plus atzimumab in the Blaze uh, one a randomized control trial. Initially, Blaze was really uh, focused on some virologic outcomes, which weren't as pertinent to uh, patient, you know, patients and patient-oriented outcomes. Um, but Blaze one also did demonstrate that there was a significant reduction in, in the risk of hospitalization or death. And I think that looking across these studies, um, that is what we see: is that uh, it prevents uh, folks with um, with mild to moderate uh, COVID-19 who could be managed as outpatients, uh, particularly those with more severe uh, complication or risk for complications, um, it's particularly effective for those individuals. And that's really why we're giving um, these agents. So banlimumab plus etzimumab was actually held uh, from the market for several months, um, but now it is back in and is available for, uh, for application again. And it was held because of uh, issues around resistance, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, Casimira plus indevimab was not held. And another thing I'll note about these trials is just because they, you know, you go where the patients are and uh, these pa these trials actually have some pretty good uh, diversity numbers. I think they more reflect um, our community in general, and they certainly reflect more of the population that has COVID-19, which is Hispanic and Black. Um, so again, it, with casivirumab plus indevimab, you can see at either dose, there was a good risk reduction in the risk of hospitalization or death. There was also a reduction in terms of the duration of symptoms, like four days, which is, which is pretty good. Um, at, uh, in June, the, uh, the, the emergency use authorization, or EUA, was extended to allow for this lower dose of casivirumab plus indevimab. And very importantly, in cases where uh, you, know, you don't have an infusion center, you don't have the setup, um, it can be administered sub-Q if necessary. Patients still have to be monitored, but I think that's a big jump forward, particularly for really under-resourced centers where you don't have, a, you know, say, a hospital or any kind of place where you could give an IV infusion around for 100 miles. Um, you know, that could be a, a potential lifesaver for patients. And the third option is sotrovimab. Uh, so this is one that came on a little bit later. It's not a combination product. It's just sotrovimab, and it's, uh, its data are similar to the others in terms of uh, a diverse population with a lower risk of hospitalization or death associated with prompt application of the monoclonal antibody. This, this study was actually stopped early um, because of a, a clear demonstration of efficacy. And the research is ongoing. I, we need to be able to keep up with this moving target uh, because as new variants are presented as, as SARS-CoV-2 mutates, there are differences in the way we can apply uh, these different monoclonal antibodies. But right now, they do seem to work. Um, and we know this from a, a nice real-world study. This is uh, more recent. Now, it's a single-center study, but uh, it's in an urban population. And so they compared folks who received monoclonal antibodies versus folks who didn't. And uh, you could see that after adjusting for um, potential confounders, including comorbidities, uh, you could see that there was a substantial reduction. And so this real-world uh, study validates that from the clinical trials that these monoclonal antibodies really seem to work in terms of particularly reducing uh, healthcare resource utilization, ED visits, hospitalization as well. But, <laughs> but, but, but we, uh, but we have to, we have to keep up. And so this is something that, you know, in, in my practice, I, I do try to pay attention to. And so, uh, for example, when banlimumab and etzimumab was, 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 uh, was pulled from the market, um, you know, that was a significant change. And really at that point, what we had was at our center, which was casperivimab plus devimab. And luckily we had enough supply um, because at that point, not a lot of patients were, you know, using the monoclonal antibodies. So you could see with the beta and gamma that banlimumab plus etzimumab have a marked uh, change. So there's, there's marked resistance. Um, but with Delta, which is, you know, currently our, our major dominant variant circulation in the United States, uh, there's more of a modest change in uh, banlimumab and etzimumab um, can be effective for those patients. Whereas uh, so far, casirumab plus indevimab, sotrovimab don't seem to have those same uh, patterns of resistance. But these are all um, different antibodies uh, that target that spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. So we don't know when the next uh, you know, variant's coming out and what kind of resistance rates it has, but it is something that we have to keep track of. So much to keep track of, but uh, that's why we're here talking about today. And of course, make sure you put in your questions or comments uh, in the chat uh, or quick Q&A box so we can address those. So um, to address the question of who should be getting um, these monoclonal antibodies, and uh, it's really designed for outpatients. So 12 years of age and up, they have to be at high risk for COVID-19 complications. So that, that long list is the patients that you know we all see every day. Um, 
the, you need to use them within 10 days of symptom onset, um, but you really want, my goal um, previously was to get the uh, mock antibody on board within 24 hours, and I actually had a few successes at that goal. Now with the, I've done a couple um, orders in the, in the last uh, few weeks, and it seems like it was more like a you know, 36 hour uh, you know, time period where they, where they actually got in for their antibody treatment. Um, but I think uh, those events were both, you know, I need a ride uh, was, was kind of one of the issues there as well. Um, you have to monitor patients for uh, administration and for one hour after. The rates of um, severe reactions uh, were not inconsequential in, you know, in the data I saw from the EUA, um, where it was, it was well under 1%, but it's like 0.3%. But as these... Um, as these monoclonal antibodies have been rolled out across the country, I have not seen a similar safety signal that there are hundreds or thousands of cases. It seems to be a very rare, rare event, but still something to be watched for uh, you know, during that infusion or even after the subcutaneous administration. And so you have to be able to respond to that. So the bottom line is mostly for outpatients, uh, 12 and over, uh, within 10 days of symptoms. That's the official EUA. It can be given to inpatients too, and I'll try to touch on that in a second. But because the original trials for using monoclonal antibodies among uh, among outpatients, I'm sorry, inpatients rather, actually uh, were negative. Um, but there is uh, you know some evidence that they might they might be effective, and I'll, I'll try to uh, I'll try to get that in a second. In terms of the criteria, like who, what is the high risk conditions? Um, the uh, I think it's uh, these are the ones we know, and so a lot of folks will fall into these uh, categories. Um, I used um, monoclonal antibodies in um, in a patient who had cerebral palsy um, and had um, and had uh, COVID nineteen. So that's a, a group that I think is is particularly at high risk uh, in terms of clearing secretions could be a real problem. But look at the bottom line there, and and you do have some discretion. So if you have a patient who maybe doesn't fit all of these criteria, but has, you know, some, some element of a couple of these criteria, you know, my inclination might be to go ahead and, and give them monoclonal antibody because say, say they're 63 years old and they have, uh, you know, a BMI of 24 with like chronic kidney disease, but it's only, you know, stage two. Um, I might think about giving them the monoclonal antibody because they're just, they're close enough with a couple of these criteria. So you can use your discretion. Um, so the NIH and the Infectious Disease Society of America are, pr are pretty much in a, of accord in terms of recommending these uh, different agents um, and uh, with the caveat that local variant susceptibility is important to consider when, uh, when choosing an agent. And, and, and they, they will, as, as they did uh, with Banalimab, uh, they, they will pull you know, from the market if there's, uh, if there's a significant high rate of resistance. One other thing that's emerged is uh, using these uh, agents as um, post-exposure prophylaxis. And so we use um, other antivirals, I, I think particularly of uh, flu prevention among household contacts, but particularly in a long-term care facility, um, is a good strategy to use uh, prophylaxis with an anti-influenza drug. Well, it turns out you can use um, monoclonal antibodies as prophylaxis as well. So uh, this is a study of casuarimab plus indevimab as post-exposure uh, prophylaxis. And you can see that when it was uh, applied at, 600, at the 1,200 milligram uh, dose, that there was a, a substantial risk reduction in terms of both asymptomatic and symptomatic uh, uh, COVID-19 infection together, and a uh, even more robust reduction, as you might expect, uh, from uh, in terms of symptomatic uh, infection among household contacts. And so that's, in addition, those who got COVID-19 had uh, you know, a, a smaller duration of symptoms if they had received casuarimab plus indevimab. That also intuitively makes sense to me. And so the EUA was expanded on July 30th. So it's for folks who are at high risk, uh, who are unvaccinated, or they're uh, expected to not have a good response to the vaccine. Either they just got it you know, within the past two weeks, um, or they only had one dose. Or, um, or they have some kind of significant immune compromise where a vaccine wouldn't be unlikely to be effective. And they have to be at least 12 years of age still and have, have you know, at least some contact. Okay, so that's casuarimab plus indevimab. Um, Bandimab plus etzibimab also has um, data on uh, post-exposure uh, prophylaxis. And this was actually done in a very important setting in uh, skilled nursing facilities. And this was, I believe, uh, yeah, so it was, 
This was published in JAMA. And, uh, and we can see that there was overall for both residents in the facility and for staff, um, and when staff were included, uh, there was a substantial uh, reduction in um, the risk of uh, COVID-19. And the EUA is similar for this one. So either Bamlimab plus Acidimab, uh, Casarimab plus Indemab can both be used as post-exposure prophylaxis. And so this is a, important to note, not yet authorized, but there is, they have looked again at, um, at monoclonal antibodies among hospitalized patients. And uh, this is an open label study with a single dose of casperimab plus indevimab. And while overall the results uh, were, were negative for this trial, the casperimab plus indevimab really didn't help in terms of mortality um, among these hospitalized patients. Among those who were in a subset of patients who were seronegative, who still hadn't mounted their own immune response, there was a significant uh, reduction in terms of um, mortality overall. So, um, so yeah, that might be a niche uh, for these agents is among folks who, um, uh, who come in and, and are not mounting a, a, a good antibody response, but that's not yet, yet authorized. And I'm, I don't know if you're ready, but I wanted to bring you in for a second uh, because you work more in the hospital and you're using um, monoclonal antibodies for folks who might be admitted for another diagnosis, but have also uh, are diagnosed with COVID-19. Can you explain how that might work? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's just as you said. I mean, it would use the same criteria that you outlined otherwise. But for someone who, you know, is admitted for a motor vehicle accident or something completely unrelated to their COVID-19, um, but would up and, and, and is found to, to, to test positive, meets the other criteria and is, and is symptomatic, those patients were definitely uh, referring for monoclonal antibodies as well. So it, that's just the distinction that the admission is for some reason that is not related to their, their COVID-19 symptoms. So it's, especially for you doing inpatient, I think that's great to know. And it, it, this is a space to watch because you have your seronegative crowd, you have your folks admitted for, you know, especially if it's something like a heart failure exacerbation, then you really, it, it would really make sense to, you know, with that high risk patient um, to initiate monoclonal antibodies. So, so I think that's, that's, that's a space to watch where we could see these monoclonal antibodies applied more uh, in the inpatient setting. But a real space to watch is um, with oral drugs. So um, we have a, an oral agent, uh, which does not, this is one that's not active um, at, the, uh, at the spike protein. So it may be uh, more effective across different uh, variants. It works, I believe, on the RNA polymerase and um, it's called monopiravir. And it just released data this morning on its trial, 775 outpatients, um, at least one risk factor for severe disease. And I believe these patients were unvaccinated and they had, uh, they had COVID-19, they take it, it's a five day course. Um, and uh, overall, what they found was uh, less risk for hospitalization or death in the monopiravir group versus the uh, placebo group, about a 50% uh, reduction overall. Um, I looked at uh, briefly at the tolerability data. It seems to be very well tolerated with a side effect profile with a numerically lower than placebo, so no major safety signals. And obviously would be a big leap forward in terms of ease of, <laughs> ease of use. Um, sorry, I'm thinking about our, the, our first protocol that I got for uh, monoclonal antibodies, which was four pages long. And it's like, oh gosh, no. Um, we, we did streamline, we, we did get it down. Then we kind of went backwards. Now we're back again, um, and so uh, so yeah. This is this is something that uh, my understanding is that they will be applying for an emergency use authorization, and that you may actually they're actually pre-manufacturing uh, molnupiravir. So this is something we might be able to start applying within the next couple months. You know, certainly by the end of 2021 is I think the expectation here. So that's this is pretty exciting. So it's a pretty exciting time when we think about all these different agents that are available to treat the, that majority of patients with more mild to moderate illness. But you just remember, this is, these are the outpatient side. Uh, it's for folks with high risk of uh, complications and they have to be at least 12. And we'll see, and of course, things will evolve from there. That said, despite our best efforts and my paternalistic attitude, where I never want any of my patients to go to the ED or the hospital ever, um, I, we still see patients who get admitted, and luckily we've got great people like I'm going to help take care of them. And so I'm going to hand off this uh, part of the talk to her. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Dr. Vega. So we are going to switch now to talk about hospitalized patients and first review um, the, the data on antivirals. So this is, um, oh, let me advance the slide here. 
Okay. So first we'll start with talking about uh, remdesivir. And this was kind of, you know, one of the first things we heard about in terms of treatment op options for hospitalized patients with COVID-19. The data for its use comes from the ACT trial. And this was a multi-site, multi-country, randomized controlled trial that looked at remdesivir versus pl placebo. And you can see, as this slide highlights here, that the primary endpoint was time to recovery. And so patients who got randomized to remdesivir had a recovery time of 10 days versus, versus 15. Uh, when they looked at mortality, it seemed like there was mortality benefit at day 15 on, from remdesivir, but that was not persistent. So by day, day 29, there was no longer mortality benefit from, uh, from, in those people who received, received remdesivir. So we'll go on to look at this a little bit more. So this, this slide here looks at the uh, rate of recovery from those in the treatment group, the remdesivir group in blue versus placebo in red and um, in days on that x-axis. So you can see you know, that there's no overlap there in, in those two groups. So there's a distinct difference in their outcomes with the proportion of recovery um, sooner, higher in that, in that blue remdesivir group. And then if we look at this by, oops, having issues advancing, um, by different subpopulations, you see in the box in the top left, that group is, um, that group are patients who did not receive oxygen. In the top right were patients who received oxygen. And then D in the bottom left is patients who received high flow oxygen or not invasive. And then the bottom right is mechanical ventilation or ECMO. So importantly, you can just see from the pictures that the group in the top right, those who were receiving oxygen, um, had the, the most benefit uh, um, from remdesivir. That's the group where there's no overlap between those red and blue lines versus in, the other, in all of the other blocks, there's an overlap suggesting no benefit of the intervention. So, so when we look at um, the tolerability, the safety, um, serious adverse events were fewer in the remdesivir arm compared to pl placebo, and the grade three or four adverse events were similar um, across both groups. So here we look at um, the guidelines from NIH and IDSA, which shows, you know, definitely just coming straight from the data, patients who are hospitalized and requiring supplemental oxygen are the ones in whom uh, we should be thinking about remdesivir. So not patients who are on invasive mechanical ventilation or an ECMO, and that's, that's true from, from both groups. So now we'll move on to talk about um, the immunomodulators where we have a couple of treatment options. And, um, so the first is uh, dexamethasone um, in the recovery trial. So really, um, this all came about from the observation that there were a subgroup of patients who had a really severe, wildly inflammatory um, immune response to um, SARS-CoV-2 that resulted in really elevated inflammatory markers and a clinical course that was pretty dramatic in that regard. And so, of course, the thought was, how can we control, control this inflammation? Let's look at de dexamethasone. So in this recovery trial, um, uh, patients were randomized two to one to get dexamethasone versus control. And it was actually stopped early because of the benefit seen. So if you can see from the bars on the right that uh, with an outcome of 28-day mortality, um, patients who got uh, dexamethasone had lower mortality overall. Um, and then in, in the subgroup of patients who received mechanical ventilation and who were on oxygen but not receiving mechanical ventilation, each of these groups showed benefit from dexamethasone. But then you can see in that last pair of bars on the, on the right that patients who were not on oxygen actually had a trend towards worsening mortality um, who received dexamethasone. So, so again, this kind of highlights the role for dexamethasone among patients who had more severe illness and were requiring oxygen supplementation. So this, uh, this is a forest plot highlighting uh, data from uh, a meta-analysis that was published in JAMA. This looked at seven randomized controlled trials 
um, that were studying steroid use. And this was helpful because they looked at um, not just dexamethasone, um, but uh, three different steroid types um, as outlined here. And you can see from this, uh, and it's also included patients who were in the ICU, who were on mechanical ventilation, and or who required at least um, six liters of supplemental O2. Um, so whether patients received dexamethasone, hydrocortisone, methylprednisone, um, uh, that was compared to usual care or placebo. Um, you can see that all, almost all of the results favor steroid use. So the bars are kind of to the left of, of, of the odds ratio of one there. And that the overall effect of this intervention um, for uh, mortality benefit was a 34% was a reduction in mortality. So um, cumulatively kind of building evidence for the use of dexamethasone or steroids. Okay, now moving on to um, IL-6 inhibitors. So IL-6 or interleukin-6 is, is a cytokine that's released in response to infection, and it stimulates a number of inflammatory pathways as a part of this acute phase response. So, so again, thinking about this subgroup of patients who had a real, really robust inflammatory response to their infection um, and, and then um, severe uh, multi-organ damage as a result of that. So um, IL-6 inhibitors, um, including tocilizumab and cerilumab, uh, are monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies that target IL-6 receptors and are used to treat these um, inflammatory conditions. So this REMCAP, REMCAP trial, a pragmatic trial, um, was an RCT that looked at a number of different types of interventions, but we'll summarize here um, tocilizumab and cerilumab compared to control conditions. So they enrolled patients who were on at least high flow nasal cannula um, and less than a day in the ICU. So these are people who rapidly escalated uh, uh, worsening uh, clinical course and had not yet been in the ICU for very long. The primary endpoint in this study was uh, combined mortality or days free of, of, of organ support. So you can see from the slide here that tocilizumab um, had a 10-day improvement in organ support-free days compared to placebo. Um, cerilumab, similar. Um, there was also a mortality benefit for each of these agents. So looking um, some more at tocilizumab in the recovery trial, you can see here, um, again, uh, if you look at the figure on the right, looking at 28-day mort mortality, um, that is reduced in tocilizumab in the overall group. And then if we look at those who had progression to invasive ventilation or death, um, that's reduced in tocilizumab as well. And then, of course, discharge at 28 days was improved in the tocilizumab or intervention group. So in each of those outcomes, we see an improvement in tocilizumab. Um, in importantly, for this, um, for this study, the recovery trial, 82% of patients were also on steroids. Of course, we just reviewed that data showing that, you know, if they are this critically ill, requiring at, six, at least six liters of oxygen, um, they should, should be on steroids as well. And in this study, most, most of them were. So this benefit was in patients who were additionally on steroids. 41% were requiring non-invasive ventilation. 45% had no respiratory support. So this slide is a, a forest plot um, uh, looking at um, benefits of tocilizumab over usual care for a number of different subgroups. And you can see basically for all of these subgroups except one, the, uh, the, the data favors tocilizumab over usual care. So this is um, days since uh, symptom onset, um, the type of respiratory support, um, and use of uh, corticosteroids is the one here that was uh, uh, a little bit iffy, um, but for, for most of these subgroups, uh, the, the tocilizumab was favored over uh, the usual care group. So moving on to another immunomodulator, this is baricitinib. This is an orally administered um, selective JAK or Janus kinase inhib inhibitor. This was actually predicted uh, uh, to work based on artificial intelligence algorithms um, that identify potential drug targets for SARS-CoV-2. And this is uh, another um, agent that impacts signaling pathways of cytokines that are thought to be elevated in severe COVID-19. 
Um, this was studied, has been studied in, in, in more than one big trial. The ACT2 trial, which looked at improved, uh, found improved time to recovery when baricitinib was given with remdesivir in patients who required uh, supplemental oxygen. This did not include patients who were mechanically ve ventilated. And um, additionally, um, these patients, this study did not look at the effect of baricitinib with corticosteroids. Subsequently, we have the CoV Barrier 2 trial that looked at patients receiving standard of care. In this trial, 19% of patients were on remdesivir and 79% were on steroids. So in this trial, we're able to see the impact of baricitinib in patients who are also on steroids. Um, you see here the primary endpoint from that study was death or progression to, to heart failure and uh, ventilation or, or ECMO. Secondary endpoint was all-cause mortality. So the 28-day mortality, there's a 38% a risk reduction there in baricitinib compared to placebo. So what are the recommendations for the use of baricitinib and tocilizumab? And that's what's summarized here on this slide, the NIH and IDSA guidelines. So again, we're thinking about hospitalized patients who are ill, they are requiring oxygen, and they are rapidly uh, declining on oxygen. So these are the patients to think about pulling these agents. So the NIH says um, for hospitalized patients, add baricitinib or tocilizumab to dexamethasone alone or dexamethasone plus remdesivir. Again, these patients would have qualified for remdesivir or dex based on requiring oxygen. Um, so, uh, for additionally, for those are on non-invasive mechanical ventilation who are having progressive disease and evidence of inflammation, most protocols are really identifying that inflammation using the CRP cutoff of 75. Um, NIH is also saying for patients who are requiring invasive mechanical ventilation or ECMO to use the tocilizumab. So, patients who are this in you know, kind of the severest um, uh, circumstance requiring mechanical ventilation, that's when you could pull the tocilizumab over baricitinib. IDSA recommendations are similar. These are, of course, patients who are requiring um, a substantial amount of O2, high flow, um, or non-invasive ventilation, ventilation at minimum. This is another slide just looking at kind of the, the uh, a graphic to how you escalate therapy um, for inpatient. So if you're hospitalized but not requiring supplemental oxygen, no need for dexamethasone. In fact, you might do worse if we had administered dexamethasone or other steroids. The data for remdesivir is plus minus. If you're hospitalized and requiring supplemental oxygen, remdesivir and de dexamethasone are indicated by the data. If you're hospitalized and requiring high flow um, O2, um, or non-invasive ventilation, that's now where we can add to dexamethasone and remdesivir, baricitinib or tocilizumab. Okay, those are the patients who are, uh, you can think of patients who are worsening on that initial dexamethasone remdesivir to escalate to add uh, baricitinib or tosi. And then for patients who are hospitalized um, and in the most severe instance, requiring invasive mechanical ventilation on ECMO, this is where we have uh, data to support tocilizumab in addition to um, the additional uh, uh, interventions that we already described. So that is inpatient management in a nutshell for these patients who can be so critically ill um, with COVID-19. So now we're going to switch uh, back to talking about uh, what Dr. Vega introduced earlier um, in the disparities um, that are still existing um, in the uh, out, uh, treatment and outcomes of, of SARS-CoV-2. As Dr. Vega mentioned, you know, in his practice, and we're seeing this all over the world, we saw this slide at the beginning of this talk, devastating uh, uh, disparities still really persist, um, especially for racial and ethnic minorities, um, particularly Black and Latinx communities across the United States. So this is one study uh, from Milwaukee highlighting some of this data, a large academic center. During the early phase of the pandemic, it was conducted um, back in March of 2020, and they found um, that Blacks had um, more comorbidities. Uh, blacks who were admitted with COVID had greater than, equal, greater than or equal to, a higher proportion had greater than or equal to three comorbidities, were more likely to be impoverished, 
And then blacks had a higher uh, risk of testing positive for COVID um, and being hospitalized with COVID, as you can see. Um, however, they also found that neither race nor poverty was associated with death or mechanical ventilation. So this is kind of a premise to the idea that there's something about perhaps the environment, uh, the, the risk factors that are playing a role in increasing the risk of, of disease and hospitalization from disease. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rangai. That, that data is really disturbing and, and sad, but at the same time, it looked like at the end of the day when patients were hospitalized, there really wasn't a difference based on race. We know that uh, there is unequal care out there for things like uh, uh, kidney uh, stones and, and long bone fractures. Black patients are less likely to get adequate pain control. Uh, for coronary vascularization procedures, uh, black patients tend to be at the end of the line for those compared with white patients. So we know there's these disparities in care in real world situations. You know, does that affect COVID-19? Well, this is a uh, study looking at a Medicare database that suggests the answer is yes. Um, so black patients, not surprisingly in the unadjusted analyses, have a higher risk for mortality. They have higher rates of hypertension and diabetes compared with white patients. So that's, uh, that unfortunately is, is something that makes sense. Usually when there's adjustment, however, for uh, comorbidities and socioeconomic status and some of those social determinants, um, there, you can see these things even out. Um, in fact, in this case, it went the opposite way. That, so after adjustment, there was even a, uh, a stronger association uh, uh, with being black and dying from COVID-19, which is very disturbing. And the um, authors of the paper drilled down and they found that certain hospitals really weren't um, sticking to maybe the protocols uh, that Dr. Ahankai uh, just espoused and sticking to those evidence-based protocols and that black patients were potentially less likely uh, to receive that kind of care. And that's been borne out in other studies as well. So this, this is the, that's the first study that I've seen that actually implicated us, healthcare providers, as part of the problem in promoting these disparities. But this is more data, a retrospective cohort study, uh, looking at individuals who are adults who are inpatient, who um, received those uh, potentially life-saving th uh, therapies for severe COVID-19, dexamethasone, uh, rates of remdesivir use, also uh, lower. And so I think it's very important that regardless of patient's background, we want to try to stick to those protocols um, as much as possible. Um, I think that keeps us away from acting on potential implicit bias. And there are cases, of course, you know, no matter what the background of your patient is, that you're going to deviate from those protocols, you know, because of kidney disease or, you know, or, you know, patient autonomy, um, you know, what have you. Of course, that's, you know, that's your that decision making between you and your patient takes precedence. But I always find that when I deviate from those protocols, if I'm thinking about the evidence-based plans of care and that best care, that you know, the care that's espoused for that individual patient, at least I have to think about it and I have to understand why I might be deviating because you know we're taking the wrong track with uh, with our black patients right now, and uh, this needs to stop. And I'll hand it back to uh, you. I'm going to talk about social determinants. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's, that's a great summary. And I think exactly that's why these protocols and algorithms exist so that we, you know, can take our, you know, personal bias out of the equation and, and stick to what the data are telling us. So this is an important slide that just really highlights um, that there are a number of different determinants of health and health outcomes. Some of them are highlighted here and they're estimates that um, about 40% of, of health outcomes are determined by behavioral patterns, um, th only 30% by genetic uh, predispositions, 15% by so so social circumstances, 10% uh, by healthcare related factors. This 40% behavioral patterns is, is interesting because we then kind of ascribe some of those to, of course, what the patients are doing or not doing. But I really like to also think about this um, you know, from a different lens, a different framework, because we recognize that even though um, behavioral patterns are very much attributable to what a person decides to do, those are even framed within the context of the environment that that individual lives in um, and social structures, which they may or may not have control over. So this is another way to conceive of the social determinants of health. It's really kind of everything around us that can impact our health outcomes things like economic instability, things like neighborhood and physical environment. And we see data that shows that your zip code where you live is 
is a more important factor in determining your health outcome than, um, than, your, than genetic variation. Education, of course, health literacy um, is a really important outcome, food insecurity, and you know any provider can tell you or, or any patient can tell you if a patient is hungry they they don't they're not going to talk to you about any other health issue about taking some pill or taking some test um, same thing for housing um, community and social context are important um, the environment um, how integrated it is um, what kind of discrimination or daily stresses are people living with and then of course there are many factors of the healthcare system dr vega mentioned some some that are um, related to provider bias and how provider care is delivered, some related to access, quality of care, all of these are really important uh, determinants of health outcomes. And this is what we think these social determinants are driving a lot of the disparities that we're seeing in racial and ethnic minorities. So, this, this slide um, comes from um, Kaiser Family Foundation data and is highlighting um, the proportion of, of pa patients who are, of individuals, not patients, sorry, receiving um, more than one vaccine dose by race um, through the end of September. And we can see, of course, um, disparities here. We've heard a lot in the media and in, in, and, um, in the data around vaccine hesitancy in different groups. A lot, a lot of variables going into this, including social determinants of health, including things like, like access, including things like environment and trust in the healthcare community. But what can, you can see here, importantly, is that there remain disparities in the proportion of different populations vaccinated by race, ethnicity. And if we don't close those gaps in vaccination, then um, the, the gaps in care outcomes will continue to persist. I'll, so I'll turn it back over to Dr. Yeah, here's a couple of quotes, which we're running short on time, so I'll let you read them really quickly. But do understand that, you know, these, you can um, download the slides if you want to take a, a closer look at them. But I think they hit home with regards to the fact that these disparities are quite real. And this is not new for those of us who have been practicing in um, in communities of color for, for some time. You know, we, we've, we've seen these same stories before. It's just with such a crisis as a pandemic, it becomes a lot more acute and, and a lot more terrible. All right. Um, so to summarize, uh, we know that being uh, Black, Latinx, uh, American Indian, Alaska Native is associated with higher risk of infection, hospitalization, and death. That seems to be mostly due to social determinants as opposed to you know some innate uh, difference in immunity or response to the um, infection itself. Uh, monoclonal antibodies currently indicate for outpatients at high risk of uh, progression of severe disease or hospitalization. Um, Remdesivir is FDA approved for all hospitalized patients. Um, it's more effective in patients who are receiving oxygen, but not on mechanical ventilation or ECMO. Um, and you want to administer some of these treatments, I'd say including remdesivir, as, as soon as possible. Don't wait. And dexamethasone has been associated with lower mortality rates among patients with severe or, or critical COVID-19, not routinely used for outpatients. I saw a question that came in. So um, before we move on, I just want to give uh, space uh, because I think it's one thing to uh, to talk about these disparities. It's another thing to actually hear story uh, from a patient who's actually lived with this. And it's a pretty dramatic story. So let's take a minute to watch this. It drives some points home. I really was feeling bad and I knew something was wrong. So when I did wake up that Friday morning, I drove myself to the ER. The doctor came and she said, we can send you home on some oral antibiotics. I said, if I stay here, will I get the antibiotics I beat? And she said, yes. And I said, I think I wanna stay. But I did that because I was scared. The nurse that was taking care of me that day, I requested to her that she um, contact the doctor because I had been on every antibiotic and my temperature was still 104. And he said, we're going to test you for a respiratory panel. We're going to test you for HIV. And we're going to test you for the coronavirus. I just hear someone screaming in the hallway. And I told my girlfriend, I said, that's my mom. So my girlfriend gets up to see, was that really my mom? And when she got up and went out the door, a security guard came and slammed the door closed. 
And I'm banging on the window, banging on the window, trying to know what's going on. Security guard kept his back to the door the whole time. I turned the wheelchair around and I looked up at the television. We are told, in fact, that there is a person who is being treated in New Orleans that is from Jefferson Parish right this now. This is a person who has contracted the coronavirus. They are from Jefferson Parish, but again, they are at the VA hospital in New Orleans getting treatment right now. Who do you think that was? All right, so um, yeah, it's just a powerful story, and um, yeah, I, uh, I appreciate uh, Kim being brave enough to tell it, and um, thought we could share it today. Okay, great. So let's move on to our Q and A portion. The first question uh, for COVID outpatient: Please describe what clinical situation you would prescribe dexamethasone. Right, so dexamethasone could potentially, um, you know blunt your immune response to infection. So we don't want to use it routinely. It has been shown for more critically ill patients to be effective. Um, but there is one situation I think about using corticosteroids, and I've seen this situation. COVID-19 exacerbation of asthma or COPD. You know, that's always the question. You know, it's such a common thing for uh, folks to come in with a viral respiratory illness as, a, as causing exacerbation of those chronic respiratory illnesses. And to me, the question is always steroids or no steroids. Um, and so I've used it in a, a couple times uh, with courses of prednisone, not DEX, um, and just because they were uh, doing worse, I could tell with their asthma or COPD. So that's the one situation where I think it might be okay for an outpatient. Okay. Uh, we have another question. If the new Merck drug gets approved, how will that impact MAB use? I'm going to go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that will be a game changer. It's an oral drug. Um, it will be, as Dr. Vega was alluding to, you know, logistically a lot easier to administer. Um, and, you know, I think this is uh, this is early data. We'll still have to get, you know, some more, you know, the, the, the population that was studied was a little bit um, more selective as, you know, as is expected for these initial trials. But I think it will be a game changer in allowing us to, you know, hopefully administer this more widely for people who meet um, indications with mild diseases on an outpatient basis. Okay, and we're just a little over time, so we're just gonna answer one last question. Um, I think a very timely one. Do you think we will see another variant this fall going into winter? Uh, it's so hard I'll, to I'll, say. I'll, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, well, you know, let me, just, uh, I'm going to start because you actually know the answer. You might have a, a much more <laughs> educated answer. I'm going to say I don't know that. But what I do know is I expect a rebound for flu this year, to, at least to some degree. I hope it's low, but, you know, with fewer people wearing masks and, uh, and uh, you know, going out and about, um, you know, with less distancing. Um, flu vaccine is really important. I'm running into a ton of apathy. They just, nobody wants to talk about vaccines anymore, but really try to vaccinate because we can assume we had such a low flu season last year. We are, uh, there's a lot of folks who are really unprotected right now against flu, so it could be bad. Let's try to get vaccinations in arms now for flu and for COVID. And I would please take it away. No, I would, I would, I would, I would, you know, amplify everything you just said. I mean, we see normally anywhere between like 10 and 50 million flu cases a year. Last year, it was like a couple thousand. Um, and that's because of all of the unique circumstances of being on lockdown, being at home, wearing masks, social distancing, most of which we are not doing. So um, being, you know, having a co-infection with two, you know, respiratory illnesses is possible in, in, in any season. Um, if that's COVID and flu, you know, the, the consequences could be dire. So definitely get encouraged at the flu vaccination. The CDC does track um, variants of interest. Um, and there's nothing um, that's coming up, you know, to, to the specter of, you know, variants of concern at this time, other than the Delta variant that we're all very familiar with. Um, hopefully that stays the, stays the case, but that is up to date on the CDC website. If you want to follow there, you'll be able to get that information. Okay, great. I think that's a great question to wrap up with. So Dr. Ahungai and Dr. Vega, thank you both so much for your time today. As always, great, important information. Um, and thank you to our audience. Um, if you'd like to claim credit, 
please click the claim credit button uh, that will appear when the webcast ends and please be on the lookout for our 30-day survey and you'll receive that via email. Uh, we thank you so much for joining us and have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Vega and Dr. Hungai. Thanks again. Thank you all. Stay well. Bye -bye.